Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome to our latest episode of Projections, our show about virtual reality, augmented reality, and technologies that are gonna merge the virtual and real worlds. Yes, indeed. And when we talk about VR hardware, so much of what we talk about is the headsets. Yep. Uh, the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, the Gear VR, um, the optics and displays, the tracking for those headsets. Those are our direct interface to the VR systems. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we take for granted with all of the ones that we use at home is the fact that they have a big cable connecting you to your computer. And that's a kind of a pain in the butt sometimes, isn't it? When you're walking around your room and you have something that you can't see that you are tripping on, or that's keeping you from going someplace far across to the other corner of the room. But it's something that we live with because we love the experience. Yeah, we're kind of resigned to the fact and honestly have kind of developed a cable sense. Like our, right. our feet, when we use tethered VR, connected to our PCs, naturally take big motions. We don't, I, I've never tripped on my, my headset cable, have you? It's funny, like a year ago when we were first tasting this, people would be very concerned at demos at you know, CES or at a Game Developers Conference about making sure that the player didn't trip over the cable because it was all new. Now they just assume that we have cable sense and we're aware of it. You're right. And some people have tried to get around the tethered experience by maybe creating a better cable experience, right? Hooking it up to a rig to, to strap the cable along your ceiling. Right, like a bumper car. Exactly. Uh, or even maybe a wireless experience. So later on this year, hopefully TPCast will come out. It's a mm -hmm. technology that we saw at CES that's going to allow for wireless transmission video between your desktop and your headset and vice versa, and the signal back to the desktop. Yeah. Uh, or maybe even putting all that computing power on your body, uh, which is what Gear VR does. That's right, and that is like the saving grace of Gear VR. It lacks the positional tracking, but the fact that you're untethered is actually the, the most wonderful thing about diving in there. That and the additional resolution that they have. That's pretty sweet, too. Yeah, you can spin around for days and not get wound up, literally. Exactly right, and John Carmack has said repeatedly that that swivel chair experience is one of the best ways to experience VR, and it works best on Gear VR for that reason. Now, if you want the full desktop VR experience, though, and you want to be untethered, uh, one of the only solutions to do that today currently is to somehow put that desktop computing power on your body right. uh, in some type of belt pack or, in some instances, a backpack. Yeah, some event, uh, some location-based VR experiences have been doing this for some time now. Uh, there's the Void, which is based out of um, Salt Lake City. Yep. And while we haven't seen it yet, we've seen uh, videos and that they're doing this very same thing. Uh, we saw um, a company at last week's the Silicon Valley VR event that were doing the exact same thing. But these are all custom backpacks that they've manufactured themselves um, to work with either their own tracking experience or the Vive. And designed for their own entertainment experience, the content right. experience exactly. too. The Void, when they did a, a tie-in with the Ghostbusters film, for example, they had their backpacks be the proton packs, and that made a lot of sense. It does, it looks right? like a proton pack. It looks like a proton pack. Well, if you wanted to use the games, that you play the games that you have at home mm -hmm. with your HTC Vive and have it in a backpack computer experience, it's a little more complicated than just plugging in, putting straps on a laptop and then plugging your headset into it. Has anybody done that? I mean, I imagine there are YouTube videos of people trying that. Yeah. But it sounds cumbersome. No, that definitely sounds, there's ergonomics, there's heat, and also the fact that a lot of the laptops, when you're running on battery power, uh, the, the time, the battery life goes down dramatically. Mm. Plus, a lot of those graphics cards don't clock all the way up. You don't get the full potential of a 1080 or a 1070 when you're running on battery power, as you do when you plug it in. Right. It's worth pointing out, too, that this is strictly a Vive experience that we're talking about. Like if you were to just put a laptop in your backpack or have a backpack that is a computer, it's limited to Vive because you, on the Oculus Rift, you have tethers going to all of your sensors. Yeah. The Vive has the wireless uh, lighthouse sensors. Yep, yep, and I, I don't think they can, Oculus at least currently, you can't have that be a, uh, a wireless solution. It's I a camera. Seen, no. USB. Plus it's power, USB and data. Uh, but one of the backpacks that we've been testing and that we're gonna be reviewing today is MSI's VR1. So they sent this to us for us to check out. You brought it home for your Vive setup. I've been mm -hmm. using it at the office. Um, and here it is, it's a backpack that is a computer. Is it the first consumer backpack VR computer? No, I think HP and a bunch of other companies have all announced it, but this is available now. Okay. It's on sale, it's a little pricey, it's $2,000, what's essentially a high-end computer with a GTX 1070, right. it's not even a 1080 Ti or a Titan X, uh, with a Core i5, um, a bunch of storage options, but really you're paying for the design. 
of this. It's about a thousand dollars more than a desktop would cost with the same specs, right? I think so. Okay. Yeah. What you're paying for is ergonomic. So if we if we lift it up, the actual computer itself is is not that big. It almost looks like a laptop, but without the screen. And it's right here. That's the computer portion. And you can see that it's not actually tethered directly to where the straps are. There's a frame. I like that about this because it not only keeps it cool, uh, but it also makes me feel a little more comfortable wearing it because I don't feel like I'm bumping into a hard drive or jostling the parts around too much. Yeah, there's no suspension system. It's not gonna be bouncing right. around at all, but that distance, just a little bit of distance mm -hmm. uh, helps a little bit. Um, and also the way they designed the cooling, the fans are actually on the sides here. I never felt the heat of the computer when wearing this and playing game, even for half an hour or 45 minutes. No, me neither. Uh, the way it hooks together is it comes with its own Vive cable. Which, which is good, you need that. Yeah, well it is, because it's short so that you don't have to have a big long thing strapped around. So it, you open up the front of the Vive, you replace all the cables, including the power cable. It's power, it's USB, and it's HDMI. That's right. And you don't have to use the Vive breakout box, it goes right in to the computer, which right. has a custom out power out for the Vive. That looks just like the breakout box. You keep the standard audio adapter on there. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just plugs right into there and supposedly like that's all that you would need. Unfortunately, setup is not that simple. No, because it is a computer and because the Vive headset isn't a computer monitor, right. to actually get everything installed, get Steam launched up, you have to plug in a second monitor and a keyboard and a mouse. There are plenty of ports on the top for that, but that still is the tethered setup experience. Well, I mean, there are plenty of ports, and if you have a mini display port... Uh, it is only mini display. So yeah. then you're in luck. If you, if you only have HDMI into your monitor without an adapter, you're gonna go to Best Buy to pick up an adapter. That's right. Um, which is exactly what we had to do. Um, but once you have it set up to, connected to a monitor, um, in my case, I hooked it up to the TV in my Vive room, then setup is okay. I recommend, if you were to pick something like this up, getting a wireless keyboard that has a mouse pad built into it, and a simple yeah. one, one Bluetooth USB dongle that would go into this. That's smart, yeah, yeah, because you want that, even if you were just wearing the, uh, the Vive headset, mm -hmm. in Steam VR, there's a desktop mode, you can see your desktop, and you can use the keyboard to type in things and, and, and move the cursor around. Right. Um, but the untethered VR experience, uh, yes, thumbs up all the way. It brought new life into a lot of the games, the older games in mm -hmm. VR, playing things uh, like Vanishing Realms and Google Tilt Brush um, and, and even a Job Simulator. It was just felt liberating. That's the word, yeah, because it's funny, even when your tether is not yanking on you, you still have a subconscious sense of it. Yeah. Cable awareness, With it, when that is removed, when this wire is directly going to your backpack, suddenly you can go all the way up to the edge of your chaperone in every single corner without feeling like you're going to get tangled up, knowing that you can spin 360, 720, keep spinning and never worry about a thing. It's like playing games that are in 360, it's quite a game changer for that, right? Because you no longer have to, that, that concern for that cable is no longer a gameplay you know, consideration. Concern. Exactly, and I think the benefits of untethered VR on a desktop sense extends beyond even having a large VR play space. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you maximize your Steam VR setup, get those 15 meters by 15 meters, a big empty room, and have untethered, you're gonna have a great experience. My concern was, can you still have a great untethered experience? Do you still get the benefits of this if you have a small, 10 foot by 10 foot room, eight foot by eight, eight foot play area, mm -hmm. or standing or 360 spinning only? And the answer is yes. I think so. Yeah, because you never have to worry about turning around and which, I, I felt lost, more lost directionally using this Makes and sense. playing this than I did in any experience because I never felt the tiny pull yeah. of that tether. And also, I felt more freedom of verticality too. I felt like I was more comfortable ducking and standing up because I didn't have to worry about where that cable's gonna flow around me and what I'd have to step over. Um, things that didn't inhibit me, like in terms of functionally for the gaming, but just it, it's, it's, it's a total mental freedom. Right, it's liberating, like you said. I mean, I think it's a taste of the future in many respects. I don't think this is going to be like the main computer that people get for their VR experience because a, a computer typically is useful for many things and people are often considered about cost. So yeah. this is not going to be the, your first choice. But in the future, 
<laughs> we, we know that headsets are going to be tetherless. We know that, that all of the power is going to be up there in the headset, and maybe there's going to be something on your belt. Maybe it's not going to be a backpack that looks like a proton pack on your, on your, you know, that you have to strap on. But it will all be tetherless eventually, and this is a great taste of that, and it's a wonderful thing. I would consider it a taste as well. I think they did a lot of good things right. They did the ergonomics of the backpack, the straps right. The straps feel good. You, they, they are mounted to the frame. They're comfortable. They put a handle in the right place so you can carry it and walk it around. Mm -hmm. You have a belt strap so it's not the backpack isn't bouncing. Even at the weight of over five pounds here, it never felt cumbersome. Not at all. Like I wear a heavy camera backpack all day long for right. conventions, and this is much lighter than that. Uh, battery life is a consideration as well. It's for sure. It's an hour and a half, and I barely got an hour and a half before we drained it down. Uh, but there are two batteries. Well, it's an hour and a half for, with, for with both, both batteries. And I watched my battery uh, go down as well, and that was just during setup. And you um, have no indication of that when you're in VR. And Well, the downside is there's no way to keep it going unless you plug in. That's the, and then that's, that, that's my biggest problem And then this. that becomes your tether. So the batteries lock in and when you pull them out, like this battery, the idea is that you can still run on one battery. Yeah, it would still be going. And swap in, hot swap in a second battery. But if you look on the battery itself, there's no place to charge this using the AC adapter. That would have been cool. I mean, the batteries are expensive. So, but I mean, if you're spending two grand on this computer, you might as well pick up a two, two more for, what is it, 500 bucks for two yeah. more batteries? Two more batteries. That would be nice. And then you could keep those charging, ready to go, swap them in, get yourself three hours you of play. You can't charge them. I know. There's no charging dock, no port on this. You have to charge it with the backpack itself, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is just a terrible design decision. And if you do want to, worst case, plug in the backpack to the AC adapter, uh, and run it powered, the location of that charging port is in a bad location too. It's in the bottom of the backpack where it could just fall out. It's pretty precarious. I'd rather have that lock into the side or the back here, someplace where it can lock and hook in. So it'll feel more like, yes, it's tethered, but feel more like um, the tethered headset experience. I think there's an argument to be made for it to be easily yank outable too in the Xbox right. controller kind of way, where if you're walking around you and you trip over that cable, you don't want to break something in this very expensive piece of kit. Uh, Fair enough. The batteries are 14 volts at about 6,400 milliamp hours. So they hold quite a bit of power, but 14 volts is not a ton of power. I mean, so this is basically running at um, a high-end laptop kind of speed. Yeah, yeah, and it's of course not upgradable. The RAM is upgradable, but like, if you're gonna spend $2,000 on a computer, I would imagine you'd wanna use it for more than just VR gaming, and this form factor isn't designed as such where you could take it off easily from the strap and make it your desktop gaming PC. Is it moddable at all? Can you access any of the parts at all? Just the RAM, Okay, that's it. Um, well, that's the MSI VR1. It is available now, but like you said, Jeremy, it's really a taste of what desktop quality VR feels like and tethered. And we love what that taste is. It's delicious. It's delicious. It's just very pricey. I think it's more for maybe developers or uh, businesses who are going to run wireless big VR setups and want an off the shelf solution without making their own backpack. That's a great point. I mean, people who want to make their own location based experiences, like in a mall, or maybe you've got funding, you've got a, you know, a space for it, like the mm -hmm. Void does. Now you don't have to develop your own kit. Now you can get an off the shelf computer backpack. Yeah. You've got some vibes, and uh, it's just a software problem at that point. Yeah, but definitely not for us. Uh, and But thanks for, thank them for sending it, and we love testing it. Our spotlight this week is on an upcoming game that we got to demo at Silicon Valley VR. It's called The Invisible Hours. It's made by a Spanish developer, Tequila Works. Um, before we get into the specifics, I gotta be upfront. I walked out of this demo starry-eyed. I was so excited. Yeah, we both walked in there kind of, you know, standard, this is another demo kind of experience. We weren't ready for anything. And the first question they had for us was, have you ever heard of immersive theater? And my ears perked up. <laughs> Norm said, yes. Uh, what, wait, is Indeed. this an immersive so theater can game? You explain what is immersive theater. Yeah, so there's a trend in theater experiences right now. New York has one, San Francisco has one, where it's a, the a theatrical experience that you walk into and you are a silent participant, you're an observer. Over the course of two hours or three hours, and a whole play or a whole musical plays out and you watch from different perspectives. You can follow people and you can listen to their stories. And the idea is that all these actors, every one of these characters, they each see and experience the story from their own perspective, which in culmination reveals the totality of a narrative, so it's, of a story. It's almost like a LARPing experience, like a role-playing experience, right? Where you can walk into this 
play, mm -hmm. but you can walk amongst the people and you can That's go right. wherever you want. You can follow whatever narrative you want. Uh, and and you, you don't engage with the actors, no. is that right? Okay. You don't engage with them, but you exist in their world cool. or you're a silent observer, maybe a ghost. Right, and then someone else who goes to this experience, they have a different experience right. and you compare notes afterwards. And that is that immersive theater concept is what The Invisible Hours is all about. It's a game only in the sense that it's a rendered world, rendered in real time, uh, they use a game engine and mm -hmm. there's scripting and there's voice acting and, mo and performance capture, but it's not a game in the interactive sense. Uh, you are, like in an immersive theater, a invisible ghost. And you hop on this island where Nikola Tesla has invited seven people to the island. Uh, famous literary characters, historical characters, Thomas Edison, for example. And they, are, they partake in an Agatha Christie-like murder mystery. Mm -hmm. And it plays over the course of an hour, about an hour. And you can watch it multiple times and you can engage and follow individual people and what they see in that span of the hour will be different and your understanding of the murder mystery will be different. And so the whole point is to maybe watch it and experience it again and again. Right, I asked him, if could you solve this mystery of what happens in this house? And there's a murder right away. Yeah. I'm, I'm not spoiling anything. It's like one of the first things you see is something, something goes down. And I said, could you solve this mystery after one watching? And he said, no, it's impossible. Impossible. You need at least, he had to think about it. He said, no, you could do it with two, but I think even that might be a stretch. And you, but you want the, the whole idea is you want the full story. Right. And I love that idea. I love the novel, that concept of theater in VR because so much of VR is about being present in a full location, the mm -hmm. benefits of being in an environment and theater which wants to transport you with performances to a full environment. Um, the silent aspect, the non-interactive interactive aspect right was something that I think each of us took differently. I, I like the, the uh, quiet wandering. We teleport around, there's a, a menu system that you can pull in to take, you, can't, you don't write down notes, but you can track and play back and follow and see what has transpired and what you've seen and keep track of that, but you never directly interact with these characters. Right, and you said intentionally so. Uh, that's something that I wanted to do right away. There are things in the environment that I wanted to use immediately when I saw them. Especially in VR, we're so accustomed to having hand-tracked controllers now. I wanted to ring the gong and I wanted to pick things up. And we, he did tell us that further in development, they're going to add some elements that you can actually interact with, but you won't ever be able to affect the story. You won't yeah. ever be able to change something or alert somebody's attention. This play will always play out in front of you. Now, what, what I wanted more of, besides interactivity, which is, which is coming, is just more going on. When I, when I imagine what you've told me about your experiences with immersive fiction, I imagine a, a bustling environment. I, I want to see a casino. I want to hear people all around me. I want NPCs everywhere. And I want to be able to sort of inter, you know, wind between the action. The holodeck experience. Right, and I want to feel like immersed in this space. This is a wide open mansion with only seven people in it, yep. is that what they said? Um, and often most of those people aren't even in the same room together, which obviously you want to be, you want to experience the full story, you have to go from room to room. Uh, and it seemed like it was a very slow paced experience. Um, you know, and that's, that's the experience that they want to create. Uh, it, personally, if I'm going to be in an environment that I can't even truly interact with, I would like to see a little bit more going on. You want more stimulus? Yes. More visual stimulus, audio stimulus, audio, was in the performances, like the way they made this game was really truly fascinating. One, the, the strength of this game is really gonna be sold on the, the script, the play that they write, right. which isn't easy. It's not linear. I mean, it is linear, but it's not one path. It's seven different characters that all need to spatially be aware of like how long it takes for one character to walk this this distance and then meet up in that room and they're gonna see something from their vantage point. It's interesting because like no game movie Anything has ever been made like this, right? Right, when you play a single player game, any type of game, even on the PC, when you walk and the NPC walks off screen, they go and they're done. They disappear. Mm -hmm. Here, that, that other NPC has a full story for the next hour and you have the option of following them. So just from a right. scripting perspective, that's challenging. Yes. Then there's the performance capture and they hired seven actors and they did the whole recording in a room and they did it re rehearsed like a play and recorded the performance capture. I love that idea that this is the new machinima, recording a play, a full seven person play in VR, and then they blocked out rooms as they would have in the rooms, and, and, and they could 
positionally track where they were and then move one to one. When a character looks around and peers around a corner, that's the actor peering around a corner in the performance capture section. Right, yeah, no, and the voice uh, capture is great. The, the voice acting is actually quite good. Um, I would just want, you know, personally, I just want a little bit more from that acting. You know, I, the, I think that there's still that uncanny valley aspect, to, even yeah. to great performance capture, where if you don't have an actual recording of the face mm -hmm. or really interesting movements or, or somehow interacting with one another. There are a lot of subtleties another, that just you can't that are, get. That are missing. That are missing. I, I completely agree. And a lot of that, you find that even in the most high budget of films, even when they have the best performance capture setups, Absolutely. it really is up to the animator. That are far from add, real time. Exactly, the, to add the subtleties into the performance. And audio mixing was the last thing. Uh, I think one of the reasons they narrowed it down to these seven characters mm -hmm. from this murder mystery was because, and, and they could have added a ton of NPCs that you had to wade between and, and fall, is the audio is so important. Like there's positional spatial audio in VR. And if I'm in one room and I'm listening to two characters having a conversation, how, at what point in the room do I want to hear a lingering conversation in another room that interests me and gets me walking over there? If you have dozens of NPCs talking, the, the audio mixing becomes a huge challenge and it's computationally not easy. Yeah, absolutely. It just, I think, would lend itself to VR a little bit. And I think it's interesting too that they feel like this is a strictly VR experience. I said, is there any plan to bring this to a two-dimensional game right. experience? And in my mind, that's not a line, I mean, that's a line you could cross. It, it doesn't seem like a game that necessitates VR. But they be really believe, and they are deep into this concept. They really feel strongly about this immersive fiction could work in VR aspect. And they think that, no, this is a VR experience through and through to its core. Um, so, you know, props to them. And I, I look forward to seeing how it turns out because they really believe in this project. Yeah, one of the things immediately after we did the demo we talked about wanting to do is because it's not multiplayer, like you and I can't be ghosts together watching the story, comparing notes. It's right. probably jump on Skype, load the game up at the same time, and go through our hour, and then jump back on Skype and, and talk about and compare notes then, and see, what did you see, and what did I see? And, and then that's the fun part of immersive theater, I think. I, I think that would be the best way to experience this game. Yeah, yeah, get together with a few friends, everyone jumps in there together, and then you compare notes and see if you can solve the mystery together. Unfortunately, like you, I asked him about that. I said, is, is, there, is it possible for you to work together with your friends to solve the mystery. The game does need to see you go through all the correct motions in order oh. to unlock the ending of the game. Got There's it. also an interesting feature in the game where you, you brought up the GUI briefly, but it's interesting because you can uh, pull up this menu system and then scrub through time. Mm. And it's interesting because you can, you can highlight a character and then you see where they go on the map and it highlights like a heat map. Yeah. You see where they're walking, where they've been, and it's, it's a way for you to uh, experience the whole game in one sitting because you don't have to see it played out in real time. You can jump in, go to a room, and then you can actually rewind time in that room until the specific thing that you needed to see uh, occurs. Just think of yourself as a time traveler. Exactly. You're, you're a time traveler and you've popped into the movie Clue and you want to get it all done and experience every single perspective and unravel the mystery. I think it's got a lot of potential here. I can't wait for that to come out. It's called The Invisible Hours, and it'll be out on all the VR platforms, PSVR, Oculus, and HTC Vive uh, later out this year. Uh, but that does it for us for this week's episode. We'll be back next week with another spotlight, another interview, and uh, more about VR, more fun discussion. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and Jeremy and I will see you next time.